Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Idleman Unplugged. I'm really excited about today because uh, someone who shares my heart for boldness. Um, boldness is contagious, and so is cowardliness. And I don't know if, Brandy, you don't really, we've not talked a lot, but uh, your boldness and others who have watched on social media has given me the boldness as a pastor in California, in Los Angeles County, to also uh, step out and be bold. So great to have you on the program, Brandon Tatum. M many of you know him as Officer Tatum on Instagram. Everything's just blowing up right now with the social media because he is speaking the truth in love. And that's what we need more than anything right now, that there's no competing voices. So I want to welcome you to the program, Idleman Unplugged. And uh, maybe the first thought would be on the burning of the U.S. flag in Washington, D.C. that just happened. Amazing. I mean, I'm still speechless. Well, Donald Trump came out on, on television not too long ago. I think he was on Fox News. And they had asked him if he became president, what would he do to people that burn the flag? And he said, give him a year in prison. At first, I mm -hmm. thought it was extreme when I first heard him say it. But then when I go back and think about it, if you burn a Palestinian flag, if you burn an LGBTQ flag, you will probably go to jail. And so Absolutely. if you can burn you, you're unable to burn those flags because they consider them hateful then I think you shouldn't right. be able to burn the American flag. And and I think it speaks to a, a bigger issue. People that are protesting, claiming to be in support of Palestinians, they actually are not. They're supporting Hamas, a terrorist group. They hate America. They hate God. They hate everything Absolutely. we stand for, although they're occupying the land that, that we have established. And we should mark them where they stand. We know that these people are anti-American and they hate everything about us. And that's something that's very apparent when you burn the American flag. Absolutely. No, I agree 100 percent. And you also look at the motive behind burning the flag to gauge, you know, a year in prison. It's not, oh, why they, they it's just freedom of speech. No, they're actually enemies of the state. Yeah. <laughs> they, this is the enemy is within. So that's a whole nother game changer. But I do I've been meaning to ask you. Um, you know, especially I, I started watching a lot of your material when BLM was popular, you know, during COVID and uh, just where, how did you come up with this idea? You know what? I've got to speak the truth, especially of course, being black and then being a, a former policeman is, uh, is incredible with the insight that you have. And then maybe just the black vote, is it shifting at all? Uh, I know of course, you know, the history of the democratic party, as do you, I, I don't know, maybe our viewers don't know, a lot of that, but uh, really what has captured the black vote over the last 20 years, promising things that, you know, they, they just won't be able to, to deliver on. Yeah, I, I, um, I've always been an opinionated person. You know, if I, if I brought my mom on, on a live stream, she would say, um, <laughs> yeah, Brandon has always had his own opinions. He's always been, uh, you know, forward thinking and, and speaking out was a thing that I took pride in, even as a kid. And yeah. so when it, 2020 came, you know, I just have built a reputation on just telling the truth and, and saying what I feel and making sure I'm informed and provide evidence to back up what I what, what my theologies are. Right. And so that's what I've always done. And that's what I did in 2020. And it, and it ended up being very crucial because we were living in a time where a lot of people were afraid. And I'll, I'll tell you and be yeah. honest, like me being black has been an advantage. Because if I was white saying some of the things that I've said, people would call me a racist and I'd be kicked off of YouTube. And I mean, yeah. a lot of things like that would have happened. So, um, you know, God put me in this skin for a reason and I have a calling to, to tell the truth. And it, it takes all of us working together. So, man, I just said, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm, I'm not I'm yeah. not going to be shy about it. I'm going to tell the truth about it. And if people don't like it. And so so be it. Don't watch my content. And that yeah. has, you know, been something I think has been very invaluable to others to give them hope and, and also encouragement and, and information about how delusional and crazy our country had gotten in 2020. Yeah. I don't know if we're getting much better, but it's, it's definitely getting interesting. Um, also on the, um, your takes on a lot of these police shootings, because you, what you're seeing is the left are using a lot of the shootings, officer involved shootings to really create a narrative. That's not even true. And then when you're able to go through the footage, I mean, it's just it, it, it seems like everything they're lying about everything to yeah. try to get, uh, you know, obviously, I think Trump out of office. But I think it was Dan Bongino. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but he made a great point that the left can't really sell us on their ideas because, it, you know, they're not sellable. They try to get us to hate the other side so much. 
that we have to vote against Trump. <laughs> you know, you have to vote Democrat. And they try to get us, you know, pitting pitting ourselves against each other. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, just overall uh, with the police involvement and the black vote and things like that. But um, we're all ears, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, going going back to the black vote, I think that the black vote is changing. I think people are sick and yeah. tired of, of getting these, these uh, loan promises. The Democrat Party comes out almost every single year, every election season, and promise all of these things that they never deliver on. And I think what people are finding out now is that it's not that they're not delivering on these things because they don't have the ability to. It's because they never have any t- intentions to. And right. so after a while, people get burnt out. You make all these promises. You tell me you love me, but then your actions are something very different. I think black men are waking up at a higher rate than black women. Um, but I, inevitably, I think that the black vote is, is translating across to the Republican side, yeah. not because the Republicans are so great. It's because right. the left has been so bad and so detrimental to the experience for many black people in America, whether you're in the inner city or you're in the middle class or wealthy. It's been a, a, a just abysmal um, act of sure. I, I wouldn't say hatred, but I'd say sure incompetence that have really hurt the black community when it comes to the police shootings. You know, I, I'd noticed this in myself when I became a cop that I knew nothing about policing. Right. I, I had no idea the way radio transmission works, the way what happens when you call 911, what actually happens, not what you think happens when you call 911, but what actually happens. I never investigated the crime before until I became a police officer. I didn't know what use of force, the use of force continuum, life and death situations, having to make all these split second decisions. I didn't know what that was like until I became a cop and I woke up and said, you know what, this is way different than what the what most people are experiencing or they are or, or what most people think that is happening. So I need to speak up and give some clarity to some of these things. And that's what I've been able to do. And, and in many cases, people agree with me. Um, in some rare cases, I'm still right. But people disagree with me because they are not looking at these police situations from the perspective of law enforcement and from the the uh, court system. They're looking at it from an emotional visceral response to some of these heinous situations that we see play out involving police and citizens. Yeah, because I know a lot of policemen, as do you, and they're trying to make it out to where all policemen are bad or racist. And, um, you know, I think that's that's a narrative. But curious your thoughts on on, uh, Kamala Harris. Where is this going to (laughs) go? I mean, the the first the first black woman president. I think that's going to be their. uh, I don't know. I'm just curious your thoughts. (laughs) Yeah, we see we see what happened when they try to virtue signal instead of picking the best yeah. person for the job. They start picking based on race and gender and things that right. Martin Luther King even said that we should not be focused on. We should be a meritocracy, which means that we focus on on the merit. Um, Barack Obama was the very first failed attempt at trying to, you know, put a person in office just because they're black. I mean, race relations declined under the Obama administration and they're doing the same thing with Kamala Harris. Man, look, be, her, uh, the president being a woman or a man has nothing to do with the inflation, has nothing to do with um, how my bank account looks, how how much or the capability of me taking care of my family moving forward. It has nothing to do with that. And, and But they're pushing that agenda because there's some mindless people to ignorant mm-hmm. folks that are low information voters that will vote for a person based on the way their hair look. I mean, it's just yeah. it gets ridiculous. I don't think she's a very good candidate. If she was actually competitive when she ran for president in 2020, I I would then be, I would say, a little more giving on the fact that she could be a competitive, um, a competitive person against Donald Trump. But watching her get smoked in the debates, Tulsi Gabbard literally ended her campaign. She was very unpopular even when she ran. She's been very unpopular as the vice president. And every negative thing that people have associated with um, Joe Biden outside of his age, she is a culprit in. She is a co-host in. I mean, Mm -hmm. so I don't think she's going to have a real chance outside of the wave of, you know, people kind of getting excited for something new. After this wave of excitement is gone, she has no substance to stand on. Yeah. Do you think she'll be able to pull in enough people, though? I don't know. I don't know. I think she's going to benefit from celebrity endorsements. I heard someone talk about that on the TV and I was like, yeah, whatever. Now it's coming to fruition. A couple of celebrities, I think Mark Cuban, which I have zero respect for him. 
Right. Um, Mark Cuban came out and said he's going to endorse Kamala Harris. So you have a bunch of other celebrities that may come out and endorse her. And you know how people think. For some reason, they think these celebrities are smarter than their own insight. But I think she you know, may gain a little bit with that. And a lot of people don't know uh, that, you know, I think there's over 3,000 counties in the United States, but only about 30 counties are really going to matter in the swing states. And my concern is for some type of election interference or fraud, um, because I, they can't, the, the, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, they cannot let Trump win. I mean, in their mind, I, I know God, God's got the final say, but they're going to be doing whatever they can. And I know you've been a Christian for a while, so that obviously plays you know, in your boldness and into your, your, your demeanor. Um, and also um, just a quick transition, the Trump shooting, what did you, th is that the most amazing thing you've seen in your lifetime or what? I mean, just barely misses his ear and uh, it, you're, you know, you shoot, I shoot, you know, 40, 400, 400 feet with a scope that's dialed in. I mean, you're hitting, you're hitting a silver dollar. It's not, it's not that too difficult. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's different shots, I think eight different shots, and they'll probably get into the forensics and different things. Um, my thought is he shot a couple, you know, good ones, nice and slow breathing. And then he realized he didn't hit the president. That's where you hear the last, you know, the five, pop, 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 you know, when you get in a hurry and you sit, you hit that trigger. Right. Um, even though the, the, the bullets did sound different, um, but I'm, I don't know your, your thoughts on that at all. Yeah, I think it goes back to speaking to, I believe, and, and I'm not saying that I've heard from heaven that God has called yeah. Mr. Trump. I haven't uh, nowhere I've heard anything like that, but I do think when I watch his personality, his lifestyle and the things that he's been able to overcome, I think mm -hmm. it could be nobody else, but God protecting him. Absolutely. And, and, and one thing I want yeah. people to understand is that God is sovereign. No matter who's the president, I think mm -hmm. God allowed, uh, Joe Biden to be the president just as well as Obama right. and just as well as Trump. And yep. and in my personal opinion, I don't think God allowed, uh, Barack, not Barack Obama, but Joe Biden to be the president to wake us up to get yes. us to realize yes. that and, and see some things that we need to see. Cause we became a little too complacent under Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And I think God did that. And I, I personally think that God is protecting Donald Trump this time. I mean, what, what are the odds? Mm -hmm. A complete yes. failure in security. And the only thing that saved his life was him turning his head probably at a 45 degree angle. And, and it literally hit his ear. I mean, he, he right. turned his head and then it still almost killed him. If it yeah. was maybe an inch different, he would have been dead. Now, my whole take on the um, the shooter is that he he clearly this is the thing that I think people should understand too. It, it, the reason why he didn't actually kill Donald Trump is because he was incredibly inexperienced and he was right. probably in a very um, I could say a, adrenal based environment. Right, For he sure. wasn't just sitting on the roof, relaxing, eating a sandwich, breathing with no right. counter uh, assault present right i mean you got to think this right. kid was he evaded police first which means his adrenaline is up unless he's a yeah. professional killer which i don't think that he was you got the nerves right you got the mm -hmm. fear you have the adrenaline you have the heart rate that's pounding in your chest knowing that if you fire some shots at the president the counter snipers are going to take you out he Absolutely. surveilled the area with a drone two hours before the event started which mm -hmm. therefore with, I don't know, a Google search, he'll figure out that they're probably going to put snipers on these high buildings to have a good vantage point. So you got a kid that's inexperienced, probably never killed anybody in, in, in a sniping situation. Adrenaline is rushing. He's shaking. He's probably nervous. He's not probably breathing properly. Fires a couple shots. Who knows if he zeroed his rifle in properly? You know, I don't know what level of training he has. He fired right. the first shot, got lucky. He probably was on, on target. Trump moved, he missed. But then after that, you got to think the panic hits in and he's just probably just pulling that trigger as hard as he can and started to hit other people. I think that he had intentions to do a mass shooting. I think he yeah. wanted to get Trump. And then when everyone started to stampede, that he was yeah. going to begin to pick them off one at a time as they ran through a certain threshold. I think that was his entire motive. And when they got outside of the event, if he still was alive, he was going to detonate some improvised device that he had that they found in his possession. So this right. kid planned this very methodically. Thank God he wasn't successful. Um, I, I'm still not convinced that there were, weren't other players involved. I right. mean, the failure of the Secret Service is very 
frightening. And it almost is so bad that it appeared to be planned. I mean, how, how could they fail that miserably? You know, yeah. I mean, walking up to the building, climbing up, they've got police inside the building and people are like, Hey, there's a, there's a man crawling up on the building with the gun. I mean, you hear him talking about it for what, two minutes. It's just, um, I can't comprehend it. Uh, because even, a, even the officer that looked up, you know, it, it, you know, if he would have just got down, just fired his weapon in the air just to draw the attention. I mean, I guess you're not thinking exactly like that right then. But there's just so much, so many uh, holes in the story, you know. But yeah. I, I don't know if we'll ever, ever find the truth. Um, well, if Donald Trump gets in right office, now. I think we will find the truth. Oh, then they might. That's true. Because then they That's have true. to disclose all this information. That's another reason, going back to your point, why I think that they are have a vested interest of him never seeing the never. White House ever again, because I think he's going to be able to expose the FBI. I think he's going to be exposed, you know, kind of what they did through Twitter and some of these social media platforms where they were actually sending messages from the White House to block the Hunter Biden laptop and different things like that. And Donald Trump has the ability to go after his political enemies um, because they've done actual crimes. And that's right. what they're afraid of, because all he has to do is, is get an FBI director or some people in the three letter agencies that are willing to do the job and go yeah, after yeah. these people like Joe Biden. His deals in Ukraine were, were obviously quid pro quo, dirty deals with him and his son. I mean, you right. go down a list. Hillary Clinton should, should definitely be in prison for her sending and receiving classified documents on a unsecured server in her basement. You know, uh, and you got more and more corrupt, corrupt politicians and now the gloves are off because when Trump yeah. was in office, it was almost an unwritten rule that you don't go after your political opponents and you don't go after sitting presidents and stuff like that. Right. You, or, or former presidents. You, it's off limits. But now they try gloves to put the off. man in prison for life. And now yeah. it's on. And they, and they can't. They're, they're terrified of that fact. And when the Twitter files came out, I was shocked that nobody made it that big of a deal. We yeah. just found out that the government manipulated social media <laughs> i mean are we hearing this it's just it's 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 mind-blowing i'm sure there's criminal things in there as well um but yeah. what what's your take especially as a christian um you know maybe i'm in california i hear it more but all this a lot of talk on civil war um i don't know what that even looks like we're not we're not in the 1800s um there's a lot of great people that are on either i mean you know law enforcement i mean what i, I don't even know that, so I understand that the, the thought behind it, but the concept concerns me a little. I don't know yeah. what that I looks think, like. I think we're already in a civil war. I just think right, the war is fought yeah. for ideas and, and social yeah. uh, structures versus uh, with bayonets and whatever the case may be. I don't know if they fought with bayonets back then. I, I have a vision of them in the civil war with bayonets, but I, I haven't studied enough to know specifically if that's the weapon of choice. Yeah. I'm but sure they did, yeah. 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 So, I mean, when you look at it, you say we're already at a civil war. Um, it's just like slavery. You know, there's a, there's a concept of slavery. Slavery still exists today. You're just not in chains and being auctioned at the auction block. You are now psychologically in, enslaved in many cases, right. not you, but I'm saying the, the, the public that are subjugated to, manipulation and brainwashing and and this sort of civil war thing is already afoot we, we have a complete difference of an idea we have complete difference of ideas in party and we're fighting every single day to win the battle of ideas on this civil this mental civil war and i think that the republican party and conservatives and christians um even though those are three different things i, I want to make sure that's very clear a lot of people conflate the two being a Christian is very different than being a Republican. You know, yes. being a Christian comes with values associated with biblical structures. Being a Republican, you can be gay or whatever you want to be and still vote for Republicans. Um, that has nothing to do with the not nothing to do, but it's not the same as the Christian faith. Right. So I right. think that the Republicans have to understand the big tent idea Um and the Christians have to still uphold their Christian values, although they are part of a party that may not be as Christian as we would like. I'll give you an example. Vivek Ramaswamy is an incredible conservative. I think he would be incredible, a Republican, but he believes in uh, Buddha, Hinduism or something crazy. Yeah. And I don't really think that that's the way to go. But is, is he a good Republican? Is he a good conservative? Yes. Would he be a good Christian? No. I mean, you know, so, right, right. you know, but I think that the Republicans need to open up the tent and be more, more accepting of these refugees 
that are coming from the Democrat Party. And I think we will begin to win the hearts and minds of more people. And then they will be um, exposed to the truth. Like Tulsi Gabbard, for example, you know, um, yeah, and that's the the tough thing because a lot of people they they're putting the two together. You know, I'm called you know white a right wing, the, all these terms and Christian nationalism, which I don't even I still am not sure what that is because <laughs> we don't put the country before God. Right, um, right. We we put, but as a Christian, we see that there are kingdoms are colliding. You know, there's two different systems going, two different mindsets. Um, and so it's not that all Republicans are Christians or the platforms innocent. It's like, hey, these are some important principles that are going to honor God's word a lot, a lot more closely than this system of ideas. And we have to choose. I don't think it's a choosing between the lesser of two evils because there's no perfect candidate. But God has given us the institution of government basically to be a tear to evil. That's really the, the, the idea of government, biblically speaking, Romans 13, is to be a terror to those who do evil. And so when you get someone like that, that's what concerns me about Kamala is with Russia, China, our enemies, um, and with the open borders, you know, we're going to see, um, I mean, I try to be positive, but the, the, the percentage of increase of a terrorist attack on our soil is pretty likely, you know, and so just having, having Christians... You know, so I know I know you're, we're short on time. You got to go soon, but I don't know if you have any final words. I know my thoughts are that the church needs to humble herself yeah. and pray and fast and seek God like never before in a broken, humble spirit and not tit for tat, uh, but to speak the truth in love and let God work through us, especially as we're as we humble ourselves. The only way we're going to get out of this is putting God first. That's it. I mean, Absolutely. you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things to be added unto you. Um, when I read that scripture, I see it as that God will answer your prayers and things will go in your favor, but you got to put God first. You can't be living some haphazard life and not praying and not seeking God and not, you know, trying to listen to his voice, no fasting, you know, not showing compassion, not acting as if Jesus, you know, like Jesus did and then expect things to go in a favorable manner. Right. You got to first seek the kingdom of God. And if America, and I won't say America because not everybody in America is Christian. Um, right. but I will say all the Christians. Like we are the ones that's going to change America around. We are the ones that are responsible for the failure of America, because if we look at it at the end of the day, what are our churches doing? Why are we not speaking up when Roe v. Wade was overturned? I think that was a a victory uh, in the kingdom because, you know, it kind of thwarted the possibility of this unending slaughter of unborn children, which is which is definitely, in, in my opinion, murder in God's eyes. So right, wh- sure. why aren't the big mega churches and, and TDJ? I don't want to call people names out, but TD Jakes and Joe right. Osteen, these people that have such influence, they are silent. And, yeah. and, and, and even when they, they try to come against the church and call this thing, uh, they call it, um, uh, Christian nationalism. Where's the church? They, yeah. They're, they're making up a term to shame and shun the ideas of Christianity. There's no such thing as Christian nationalism because if you go back and look at it in history of our country, conservatives who wrote the uh, Declaration of Independence and all of the documents, our founding mm-hmm. fathers were all Christian nationalists. If you if you put it in perspective, sure. yeah. and I'm not saying to the T because some of them probably weren't. But when you look at the concepts you see in our in our uh, courtrooms, we have the Ten Commandments. You know, right. when you see on our money, we have in God we trust in our Pledge of Allegiance. We say one nation under God. The foundation of this country was Christian nationalism. And we have gone so far in such a wicked, cowardice way away from God that we have now given the illusion that this country was 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 kind of created for all these other theologies. And that is not true. The reason that we're here today is not necessarily Judaism. It's not necessarily Islam. It's none of that. The reason we're here today because of Jesus Christ and the men and women who follow Christ and who established this country. And the only way we're going to get to the, to the promised land of this country getting better before the end is that Christians have to unite. We have to be bold. We have to be strong and we have to vote the convictions of the word of God and not vote the convictions of a party line or a skin color. Right, right. And I think it's good. I mention names sometimes too, like Andy Stanley, 
um, Steve Furtick and even my area, Rick Warren, all they're silent because they're going to lose half of their base. Right. And that's, I mean, that the truth is you're more, they're more concerned about people's opinions than the opinion of the word of God. And, uh, you know, but I'll I, tell you, I, I tell you what, that I, I don't think that they, I think that it's a, it's a trick of the enemy oh, to sure. that they believe that they will lose. Right. It, it's because True, yeah. when you're in ministry to gain money, and fame in the building, mm-hmm. you do fear the trick of the enemy saying, Oh, you're going to lose all of this. See, mm-hmm. to lose in the world is to gain in Christ. And, and, and right, right. I think if these pastors are saying, I, I'd rather be less worldly and get more Jesus up in here. And Amen. to be honest, people will follow you. I, I was just, people would yeah. think that the world is secular. I, I, I used to do live streams back in 2020 and I have about 20, 30,000 people watching live and I'll say a prayer at the end and it still will be 20, 30 people watching live. There wasn't a single drop off. Wow. People are wow. seeking and wanting to hear truth. They don't want to yes. hear that watered down mess. And yeah, you grow your church to a certain degree, but you, you growing your church with fluff. It's like having a bag of potato chips and half of the bag is air. Well, you know, there's no substance there. The big, the bag is big, but there's no substance. There's no power. And so if these pastors would say, I'm going to take a stand, I'm going to believe in Christ. He never let me down. And I'm going to tell the truth no matter what. I think that their churches will be just as big. You just yeah, get the, the air out and put some actual right. chips in there. Right, right. Did you see that Barna, Barna had a... Uh, recent survey, I don't know, might have been a couple of years ago now, Jim Garlow spoke at my church and gave the survey and like 91% of all Christians are wanting their pastors to speak the truth about these issues. Mm-hmm. It's like overwhelming majority want the pulpit to come alive with political issues. We're, that's our job is to also show how the word of God is, is relevant. Right. We do it in every other aspect. Right. We can tell you how you yeah. can prosper in life. We can, we can tell you how you pray for your grandmother who's got terminal cancer or whatever the case may be. We talk a lot about all every other aspect of life and how you use the word of God and, and you embody the word of God in your lifestyle right. to make you uh, have the experiences of all that God has offered you in this life. But then we get to certain stuff and we don't talk about it. It's like, well, Pastor, you did a whole series on X, Y, Z. But you mm-hmm. haven't talked about abortion and I'm confused and I don't know what yeah. to think. The world is telling me this, but my pastor is silent. Right. A, a lot of the women in the church, it's, there's still a, a huge number of women in church that have abortions. And, and the yeah. reason that they do is because they don't hear from anybody other than the world. They need yes. to be hearing from God. I mean, they need to be hearing from the man of God and they need right. to get prayer because some of these women will, are just waiting for the pastor to say, if you are struggling with this, Come up and let me let us right. pray for you. And these women or, or if you're a woman who've had an abortion and you have mm-hmm. that burden and regret and that shame, let us come pray mm-hmm. for you that God can release that off your heart and forgive you and you can move on with your life. Women would be flooding to the pulpit with oh, tears absolutely. in their eyes, with joy in their heart that they can actually yeah. be forgiven of such a sin. And if they would do that. The young women who are in a situation where they have an unplanned pregnancy will feel more confident that the yeah. church is is acknowledging this and not that right. they are like, if I say something, I'm going to be a harlotan and nobody's ever going to talk to me again. And I'm ashamed. So let me creep out and have an abortion and nobody would ever know. Right. It's like that's not the approach of the church. The approach of the church is do what God told you to do and he'll take care of the rest. Yeah, there's a, there's supposed to be um, a place where they can get healing and hope and also speak the truth. You know, I opened up years ago about uh, me conceding to an abortion with, with my girlfriend in my 20s. A baby was about six weeks old. I still get, you know, teared up. And um, many years ago now, I don't know how many years ago that would be, 30 maybe. Um, but also pointing them to the cross. There's hope and freedom. You don't have to live in the past of your mistakes. Mm-hmm. So we can still point out the sin and call our nation back, but we can also offer the hope and redemption. You know, it's, it's, it, you, if you don't have both, you're going to be lopsided. But final question, what are all the verses on your arm? Oh, it's a bunch of, of uh, Ephesians, Acts, Peter. Yeah. These are, these are all my kind of, I wouldn't say sal- salvation verses, but these are the things that I, that I love. I could pull the mic up. Um, you know, we got Deuteronomy six and four. I think I yeah. go down, I got John three and five, which is obviously being born again. And then I got John 17, three, when Jesus was said, you know, when he was in the garden before he got 
uh, crucified. He had yeah. said he had made mention that that the world should believe in you, the one true God and your son, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He said this yeah. is eternal life. I think you remember that scripture. And so James 226 is that, you know, faith without works is dead. And then first Peter 321 is that baptism do save you, not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but answering unto God of a good conscience. Acts 238, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus. Like that whole thing when they at the right. day of Pentecost. And then the Ephesians one is that the Holy Spirit is the seal. Um, to your salvation. And so I, 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 these are some of my favorite. I didn't have room to put all of them on there. I mean, my whole body will be filled with scriptures, but these are just some of my favorites that have fit on my arm. (laughs) So, but they, 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 how long have you, how long have you been, not been serving as a, a, uh, policeman anymore? Since 2017, I I left the police department in 2017. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, man. And I, and God has God has really blessed me to to be in this position, and I just want to you know I, I remember saying a prayer a long time ago when I I didn't have nothing, and I was uh, a cop struggling, and I remember saying God I knew this before I was a cop when I was when I was a football player when I was playing for the University of Arizona and I was sitting on a bench and I, I thought my whole life was over. I remember saying God when I first got saved in 2008. I remember saying God, I want you to use me. Forget me, forget all my future aspirations and none of this stuff that I'm talking about, because I understand that I'm my mind is finite. I don't I don't see the world the way you see the world for me. You see the future. I don't just use me. Just use me. Whatever whatever you need from me, God, let me be a vessel that my talents and abilities can serve you and serve the kingdom. And I remember saying that prayer and he took football away from me and I was mad at him. (laughs) <laughs> I say, how dare you oh, do yeah. this to me? <laughs> you know, but then now I look back and I say, okay, God, this is what you, this is what I pray for. And you answer it. I now have the ability to impact right. as many people as you, you know, allow me to impact. And that's, that's probably the biggest yeah. blessing of my life. So. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for what you do. And all of you listening, you can follow him at uh, it's officer Tatum on Instagram, I believe Twitter as well and the other social media feeds with YouTube and Rumble. So thank you again so much, Brandon, and um, we really appreciate your time. Well, God bless you, man. Thanks for having me. 